Hi, everyone. We are so happy to have you, whether you are joining us here today or watching later on the Cure Gaba A YouTube channel. We ask that you please mute your mics if you have not done so already and include any questions you might have in the chat box below. We will have time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. My name is Monica Joanna El Nakabe, and I'm the founder and CEO of Cure Gaba A, a nonprofit organization with the sole focus to develop potential therapies for Gaba A variants by partnering with world renowned researchers in Gaba A and the Organization of Patients for Clinical Trials. Today, we welcome Dr. Anna Falzer. Dr. Falzer is a translational neuroscientist whose primary research focuses on unraveling the earliest molecular and behavioral changes in monogenic neurological diseases. Her expertise in translational neuroscience led her to her recent appointment as the Chief Scientific Officer for Combined Brain. <laughs> The collaboration with Cure Gaba A and Combined Brain is to create a Gaba A bio library. Dr. Falzer will present a webinar explaining the crucial role of biomarkers in Gaba A variant research. So I'm handing it off to you, Dr. Falzer. Please share with us your presentation of the what, why, and how to bio collection for our community at Cure Gaba A. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Monica, for that amazing introduction. I'm so impressed. That was so thoughtful. Okay. Um, yeah, so I hope that I will answer as many questions as I bring up. And at the very end, I have my email address um, so people can either email you, Monica, or myself, um, any questions, concerns, etc. And then I'm happy to put the link or send Monica the slides afterwards so people can look at them again. Um, so as Monica already stated, I work for an organization called Combined Brain of, um, I think it's somewhere between 80 to 90, maybe even 100 patient advocacy groups, um, one of which is Cure Bat Grab A. And but yeah, so our goal is just to um, figure out how we take each individual patient advocacy group and where they are in the drug development process and figure out what things we can do to facilitate them getting closer to meaningful treatments in their kids. Um, so today, what I wanted to focus on was one particular um, initiative that we've really um, we've launched fairly recently, but it's been very popular, and I think you guys will understand why pretty quickly, which is launching a biorepository um, in an effort to discover biomarkers for our disorders. So um, in order to sort of place the importance of biomarkers and banking biosamples, so samples from your kids or young adults, I think it's really easy and it and it's visually makes a little more sense to show you what the overall drug development uh, process and timeline looks like. And I I borrowed this slide from our founder, Dr. Bichelle, but it's incredibly helpful for giving people sort of a visual of what the steps are and what the parts are that have to happen before we start getting a number of really amazing, meaningful treatments into our, our kids. Going. I'm going to start on the left hand side of this screen here where, you know, your, your kid, you bring your child in and they get diagnosed with some um, genetic variant, pathogenic, genetic, pathogenic, genetic variant. Um, and so for most of the people probably watching this, this will be relevant to GABA A, GABA -A variants. And then the sort of next step on this pipeline here is that researchers or clinicians need to establish research models for this disorder. And here is the first place where um, patient samples come into play and are really important because you can make animal models. So here's a picture of a mouse, but you can have rodent models, other animal models of a disorder. And you can also have cell models. So many of you have probably heard of um, stem cells or neurons for different neurodevelopmental disorders. 
And one of the best ways to generate those models are to get some kind of sample from the kid carrying that genetic variant. So this is the first place really where, you know, you can see clearly a demand and an importance for getting patient samples to establish these cell models. And then as you're going sort of from left to right on this timeline, you can see that the importance of natural history data collection and natural history for disorders like GABA, children with GABA-A variants is really just a way of saying, we need to know what the natural progression of this disease or disorder looks like in order to figure out when interventions or experimental therapeutics help um, either delay or prevent disease progression. Um, natural history studies take a number of different forms that can be in person in a, one of your clinicians or uh, more recently, they've launched several online natural history platforms. I'm not gonna go into a lot of that um, right now. Um, Monica will probably have someone talk a little more in depth about that, but um, then you have researchers that are investigating, you know, what are the other mechanisms within the cell that are impacted by this genetic variant? Um, and then you have disease concept studies, which really are based upon interactions with families that give researchers and clinicians the idea of the priorities of symptoms that need to be treated within the disorder. Now, um, on the bottom half of this timeline here, you can see biomarkers, right? Biomarkers, I'll explain a little bit later in the next couple of slides. I think I have definitions, um, but they're really um, objective measures of um, where in the disease stage a person is and um, are objective indicators of whether a certain intervention, therapeutic intervention, is, is beneficial to that uh, individual or not. And then patients um, developing patient-centered outcome measures, other basic research models that you need before you're able to put those interventions in um, clinical trials, and then obviously approved FDA um, uh, uh, treatments. Ready already. Okay. So um, I've said the word biorepository a, a couple of times already, but um, what do I mean by a biorepository? Um, so if you recall on that slide before this, there's a couple different places in the drug development pipeline that patient samples are really critical for, which I actually should have done a better job here, but biomarkers are <clears throat> primarily discovered um, using different types of patient samples, whether those are like biological fluids, uh, other something from a tissue, some physiologic readout. Um, but these are almost always something that is um, validated in some type of human sample. So this is another place on this drug development pipeline that patient samples are really critical. Okay, I got ahead of myself. So in response to this, understanding that patient samples are really critical to a lot of the projects and initiatives that we had as an organization at Combined Brain, we started a biorepository. Um, and a biorepository is really just a title that you give a facility or some physical place um, that collects, sort of facilitates the collection um, the processing and the storage of a variety of different biological materials. Um, and those can be from humans, those can be from animals, they can be from plants, you know, it's anything that would be a useful biological sample in the um, development of various uh, treatments. So our biorepository, it sort of has, this looks like three different buckets here. Um, I'll focus on the one in the middle here first, which is, um, and this has really been the focus of what we have collected since we started the biorepository. Um, so we collect blood from patients. This is shorthand for cerebral spinal fluid. We collect um, salivary samples. We collect urine samples. Um, and 
this should be split up into a couple of different pieces here, but we also are able to collect samples that we can develop into cell lines, which we can um, uh, sustain and grow and hand out to interested researchers. And so some of those are fibroblasts, which I can type, that's been really, um, there's really a huge demand for, and I think it's largely because researchers can use this cell type, which is right here, induced, induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, you can turn induced pluripotent stem cells or stem cells into different neuronal subtypes, which are some of the subtypes that are most implicated in, you know, kids who have cure GABA-A variants. Um, okay. And so I, those are sort of just a snapshot of the biofluids and cell lines and cell types that we store in our biorepository. Now I'll go over here next. So we can also collect tissue samples. Um, most, the most common tissue sample we collect is a tissue biopsy. Um, and this is a very small, um, piece of skin that's collected from um, various locations. It's really dependent on the clinician um, and uh, is most frequently used to generate a, a fibroblast cell line that can be used to generate, distribute to researchers. And then the other type of tissue sample and donation obviously is um, a, a post-mortem tissue donation, which is obviously very Sensitive subject matter, probably something that we would devote a whole webinar to it, but we are, we collaborate with a group at the University of Maryland to um, coordinate and collect postmortem tissue samples. So the left-hand side of the screen, which is just as important of a part in this biorepository as the actual biological samples, are the um, clinical information that we collect from people. And and there are, we use a variety of different, or we collaborate and work with a variety of different online natural history studies. And so what we do is we really encourage people who are participating in our biorepository, they get a certain subject ID and it's called a CRID, which is what's written down underneath each of these little columns here in red. That is a study ID that's generated by the participant. So what we really do is we encourage participants, if they have a profile for their child or anyone in their family on one of these natural history studies, um, we encourage them to use the CRID um, when they're establishing their natural history uh, account on whatever platform they're using, because what that does, it, is, it allows us to link um, clinical information about their child to a biological sample that they're maybe going to donate to a researcher um, or someone who's can use to just further interpret some of the results that they're seeing in their experiment. So this could be just a no-brainer, but some of the most basic ways that biorepositories help in developing treatments, specifically for kids with rare disorders like cure GABA A, it's really, it facilitates sample accessibility. You know, with rare disorders, we are needing to find efficient ways to collect samples from the few individuals who are diagnosed with these disorders. And so we're using it as a centralized way to offer these really rare samples to researchers who are interested in it. So it really increases the sample accessibility for these rare uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. It really facilitates biomarker discovery. So we have a handful of biomarker projects that are ongoing right now that are really exciting. And as I said on a couple slides before, you know, biomarkers are really important for determining uh, later on when there are clinical trials. These are indicators that the you know medication, experimental medication, is working or not working. Um, and, and biomarkers, in this case, since we're talking about biorepositories, are really, you know, uh, things that you can measure in any of the biological samples that are donated. So like blood, cerebrospinal fluid, even saliva, urine, um, you know, dried blood spot cards. So a couple drops of blood that we collect from children can be a variety of sample types. And then the 
The third thing that I have listed here, and I'm sure this is certainly not exhaustive, but is these biorepositories, in particular, the cell lines that we can establish are really the foundation for doing a lot of drug discovery or drug screening that a lot of our groups do um, in terms of finding disease modifying compounds that can help alleviate some of the symptoms and the severity of the disease while other researchers are working on more um, you know, curative or chronic sustained treatment options. Um, and so this drug discovery option really here leverages the cell lines that are established and maintained um, within our biorepository. Mm -hmm. So this is a little redundant from the first slide, but I really wanted to repeat um, and say that you know, there are a variety of different sample types that we store in our repository, and there are a variety of different sample types that answer different questions and can be helpful for different things. So I'm going to repeat all of these things that you can potentially donate again, just for you to keep in mind, you know, the next time your child might be having something done, what's the feasibility of collecting some of these sample types that we could store? So again, we can, one of the easiest and most popular and most helpful is, you know, a variety of different blood samples. Um, and cerebrospinal fluid is obviously very limited to certain situations, but it's incredibly helpful. And so um, that is a sample type. If that was ever an option, um, we always encourage uh, donation or for CSF for research purposes. Um, saliva and urine are also really helpful, and those are helpful for a variety of different um, uh, experiments. One of the ones I can think of right now would be, you know, you saliva, you can measure uh, specific compounds in saliva that are helpful for informing uh, disease status, as well as, you know, you can um, extract DNA or genomic content from saliva samples too. Um, so it's a non-invasive way of potentially discovering biomarkers. And then, of course, the cell lines that I talked about uh, previously, fibroblasts, peripheral blood mononuclear cells isolated from blood, and then the generation of stem cells and tissue biopsies. How do they help with developing treatments? And most importantly, who can donate? So for the people who are listening now or listening later, um, in terms of the combined brain repository, the people we are able to collect from right now are anyone of any age who's been diagnosed um, with a neurodevelopmental disorder. So in this case, um, the most relevant for people listening would be diagnosed with a cure GABA-A variant. We're also able, though, um, to collect from individuals who have related disorders. So children or individuals with other GABA variants or GABA receptor variants. Um, there's a little flexibility in the other samples that we're able to collect outside of those directly specified as combined brain disorders. Um, the third thing that's almost just as important as collecting from individuals who are affected with a particular disorder are samples from unaffected, um, preferably related um, individuals in the family. So siblings, parents, and then, you know, unrelated um, donors are able to participate as well. And this is all age ranges. So anyone from infant to adult is able to donate. Um, importance of having unaffected family control samples for a lot of these different types of experiments is really um, critical because it gives um, researchers and clinicians a, a comparison to um, compare the sample information from the affected individual. So a couple caveats to what I just said, which is right now, unfortunately, this is a huge limitation right now that we are um, constantly trying to to fix is that we're really limited to collecting from samples from individuals who are in the United States. So um, this can be people who primarily live internationally but come to the United States 
um, they're able to donate, but unfortunately we can't proactively collect samples from people who live outside of the United States currently. The way we can get around this is that um, we are able to collect samples which have been previously collected for some other reason and are currently being stored elsewhere outside the United States. So under these um, uh, situations, so if someone had a blood sample that was collected from for some other clinical reason or research reason and it was stored outside the United States, we can have that sample transferred into our biorepository it requires a couple pieces of paperwork, um, regulatory paperwork, like the parent has to consent for sharing their sample with us. But this is um, you know, one way that we're able to incorporate international samples. There are a variety of ways on how you can donate. And it really largely depends on the type of biological material that you or your family member, or your child wants to donate. So um, we are able to sort of piggyback or collect a research blood sample in tandem with um, a, a clinical procedure. And so that is, if your child is already having a blood sample collected for some reason, um, we've had some success on getting an additional research tube drawn at the same time. Able to transfer in previously collected samples and then the other major um, uh, successful thing that we've done is that we've collected from annual conferences. So um, the other thing to mention is that we can collect, you know, skin biopsies or tissue biopsies, and really that's, you know, more invasive, and so it's limited in scope and how we're able to collect those things. Those are primarily collected. Um, in tandem with some sort of clinical procedure. Like I wrote some examples here. If a kid is having a surgery or some sort of um, some sort of operation uh, and there's either excess tissue removed or supplemental tissue or there is an incision site which we could you know collect a small tissue sample from, those are the types of situations where we can really you know capitalize off of that, whatever clinical procedure is happening and collect a small sample for our biorepository. Um, another example of this is if the kid has to have a lumbar puncture for some reason for a clinical diagnostic test, a lot of times they will save samples um, and many times they don't need that excess sample, in which case that would be a great time for us to transfer it into a biorepository um, for a researcher to be able to use. And then the other thing is what we talked about a little bit is thinking about post-mortem tissue donation um, uh, is also an option and something that people can um, register for as well. This is sort of, I tried to streamline the process of what this looks like and also importantly, sort of the time commitment that it takes for various collections for, for things to be done to donate to the biorepository. So um, what I tell communities is that anytime you or your family member are having an upcoming blood draw or any sort of clinical procedure and you're willing to participate in research at the same time, under certain circumstances, you can do some of this stuff independently, like a blood draw or a skin biopsy. If you're willing to participate in research, the first thing is contact your patient advocacy group leader. So in this case, you would get a hold of Monica. Um, and sort of discuss the circumstances with Monica. Um, so the overall process from sort of a 10,000 foot view of what this looks like is, you know, you contact your patient advocacy group leader. The patient advocacy group, so in this case, Monica will get a hold of someone on our research staff and they'll say, you know, they'll just sort of describe the circumstance and they'll give um, your information to us We'll reach out to you and schedule a time using, you know, Zoom or some sort of video teleconferencing system to consent, uh, you know, explain what happens with your child's sample. Um, and this usually takes somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how many questions, et cetera. 
And then after you're consented, someone from our staff will send the necessary collection supplies and shipping materials to the participant. The participant has, you know, whatever sample collected. And then the either the research or the family member ships that sample overnight to our lab and we process it, you know, accordingly. But then at that point, the samples are readily available to interested GABA researchers. And um, so this biorepository is um, governed by the patient advocacy groups themselves. And so um, sample distribution is, is dependent and determined by the patient advocacy leader themselves. So in this case, this would be Monica. And one thing that I always want to reiterate is that your samples, whenever samples are distributed to any interested researcher, um, they are always sent out in a de-identified way. So they're always sent out with that CRID sample ID um, that we use for all of our samples. Your name is never given to any, any researcher who receives any of your child or your young adult samples. Okay, so costs to participate. So many sample collections are free to participants especially when you do it in tandem with clinical labs or in tandem with clinical procedures. So those are almost always exclusively free. Um, however, there are some when you're doing research collections independently just for research purposes, there are often some costs associated with those. And this is um, sort of averages from what we've seen from doing this type of work previously, although it can vary based upon where you are and, and what you get done. Um, but just as a ballpark, so people sort of know, it's about somewhere between five and $600 to have mobile phlebotomists go to your participant's home. And then there's usually some kind of co-pay if, if a participant goes in to get a skin biopsy with one of their clinicians. If anyone has, I guess I went a little quickly, but if anyone has any questions, um, here's my email address, and then I put Sasha's email address on here as well. She's one of our biorepository bio repository coordinators. Um, I'm happy to um, answer any questions that this might have brought up. Um, and then obviously you're also encouraged to get a hold of, of Monica as well. Okay. And thank you so much for doing that presentation. That was very informative. I have some questions that came in. Oh, yeah. uh, of, <laughs> there's actually a few. Okay. One of them was already answered. What is a biomarker? Mm -hmm. um, but from the same person, they're asking, can you explain what a research model is and why we start in cell models? Sure. So a research model is, um, you should think about it that you need some um some strategy for understanding how diseases work. Um, and you clearly can't do that using, you know, brain samples from a child who's affected and you clearly can't dump experimental compounds on, on children. And so the whole idea of having research models is you're having um, something other than a, a pa the patient themselves to try and understand what might be helpful in that kid. And you usually try and make the model as close as you can to, to replicate um, what might actually be beneficial in a, in a child. So, you know, rodents, rodents are not children, frogs are not children. Uh, fruit flies are not children, but they all have, you know, similar parts of their genome or neuronal functioning um, or, you know, GABA uh, localization that make them a relevant model for studying, you know, GABA A uh, variants. So, so it's a little bit of a long-winded way of saying research models are um, sort of non-human uh, non-living human models that are necessary to sort of interrogate the consequences of cure of GABA-A variants, and then also to test therapeutics on 
that hopefully will be informative of their impact on on uh, humans. And then Mia wants to know, what is the timeline from a bio collection to a clinical trial? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if a bio sample collection is really directly related to the timing of clinical trials. Um, I would think about it as, you know, step one. Step one, we want to collect biosamples from the community so that we understand the disorder. We understand what happens on a cellular level, in a mouse model level. And then after we know that and we have a good idea, then that sort of gives us some ideas on what compounds exist might be helpful in those models, i.e. and also in those kids. Then it also gives us ideas of what are some genetic strategies that we could start testing on these samples. And then, you know, once we get information from that, that really dictates when we start having pilot clinical trials. So it's almost like you 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 need one before you you can start thinking about the other. They really lay the groundwork for the timing of when you're going to have your first clinical trials. I will say one thing though is that clinical trials don't mean like necessarily a genetic intervention, which has been there's been a little bit of confusion around that um, in the other communities that I've talked with. You know, you can have a clinical trial in in a short period of time that just looks at whether a compound that already exists that works in a totally unrelated disorder might be helpful in your kids. Um, so, so those types of clinical trials happen much sooner than things that are directly tied to uh, GABA-A genetic material. And then Mia is also asking, uh, how big of a skin sample mm. would it be? Okay, so how big of a skin sample yep. would it be? Great question. So great. So it's um, three millimeters. So if you think about, oh, this is too big actually. Um, I think of it as like a, a little bit wider than like a grain of rice, smaller than a pea uh, and bigger than a grain of rice. Those are, I wish I, I should have like a size example in my head, but something a little smaller than a green pea. Okay. A lentil. A lentil. <laughs> <laughs> This is a good segue question. Uh, Michelle from New York wants to know There's um, so if you people. can create, I know I got a lot of questions okay. before and we have people here today. So Michelle wants to know if you can create cell lines from blood. Yeah, so um, those would be um, cell lines. So there are some cells present in like a, whole blood that you would collect from a, a kid that you're able to isolate and store and you can make sort of a sustainable cell line um, from those few white blood cells that you collect from a whole tube of blood. So yes. We wanted to mention that we're working on putting together our first ever family symposium for Cure GABA A. Awesome. And um, you know, the logistics aren't in place yet, and I'm probably speaking about this too soon, but for families to know and to have um, something to look forward to that when we do have this symposium, we would invite Combined Brain and then we would do the collection all in one day. Yeah, we've had a lot of success doing that, and I think that's really the best way to get a good sample cohort in one sort of one setting. Any takeaways, it's if your kid is ever having anything collected from them, whether it's for another research study or for whether it's a clinical reason, get a hold of you and say, this is happening. What can we do? What can we leverage if my kid is already being put under anesthesia, or my kid is already having blood drawn or whatever, what do you need? What's helpful? I think that is like if if parents families just keep that in their mind like oh you've got a doctor's appointment in a month or blah 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 
that's always been one of the most that's always been led to some of the most success in like community participation that I've seen. And at that point, they would contact Cure Gaba A and mm-hmm. we would um, contact you and send out a kit. Yep. So they contact the process is they contact you. They say this is being done. Is this helpful or what can I do? And then you guys sort of figure that part out. And then you say, Anna, you or someone on your team, this get a hold of this person. They want to do this. And then we sort of figure out the rest. Okay. Great. Anna, thank you so much oh, for joining so us today. <laughs> This was such an informative presentation, and I think it's really going to encourage families to go and, um, you know, give their bio samples because they are so important. And you really, really spoke on that. So thank you so much, Anna. Oh, my gosh. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. All right. Bye. We'll see you soon.